Welcome to the Meme Tune Program, Episode 1. Today, I'll be programming a large EMU modular in a section called Patching Today. I'll be looking at the history and development of the monosynth in a section called Switched On. Today's synthesizer club features some vintage ARP equipment. And I'll be looking at some old video gear and how I do synthesis on it. But firstly, it's switched on. In the early 1970s, nearly every band in the entire world got a new band member. The synth player. It's difficult to underestimate the significance of the monosynth in popular music, because it really did something very important to change what we hear on the records we listen to. These instruments added a certain futuristic edge to pop, rock, jazz and modern classical music. And eventually, a whole new genre of music emerged in the form of synth pop during the 1970s and 1980s. The monosynth came from a very simple idea created by Don Buchler and Bob Moog, namely that of voltage control. And the first example of a commercially available monosynth can be traced back to 1969 when the Mini Moog was introduced. The team of engineers at Moog Music had the clever idea of shrinking down all the most important features found in their huge modular systems into a more compact, manageable and affordable product. And the monosynth was born. Once the Mini Moog had successfully been launched into the music world, many other manufacturers took the idea and developed their own monosynths, shrinking down large modular systems into their more affordable siblings. Of course, some manufacturers entered this market for the first time with brand new products for this new corner of the music world. Some instruments were designed to be placed on top of organs, so they had their controls along the front edge to give more traditional keyboardists a new palette of sounds. Others had built-in digital note recorders or sequencers, like the SH-101 from 1982. Some were designed to be more complex studio instruments, such as the Korg 800DV, 
The DV stands for dual voice because this synth has two independent mono synths in one box, but controlled from one keyboard. This is Roland's flagship mono, the SH5 from 1976. It's got everything the Minimoog had, plus a lot more features, such as multi-mode filters, sample and hold, oscillator sync, and ring modulation. Mono synths continued to be developed into the 1980s, but by then were losing their popularity due to the growth of the polysynth. By the mid 1980s, most of the features of mono synths, the VCOs, filters, and envelopes, were shrunk down again and fitted into polyphonic versions, which I will cover in another episode. Let's take a closer look at the classic Mini Moog, which was such a good design that it contains all the basic elements found in virtually all mono synths to follow. Here we have the VCOs going into a mixer and then into the filter and VCA, which are controlled by two envelopes. This is a diagram of how the different elements in the Minimoog connect together. There are three VCOs, with the third one also being able to be switched to low frequency mode for modulation duties. These go into a mixer along with a noise source. The final mix goes into a filter and then into the output voltage controlled amplifier. There are two envelopes, one for the filter and one for the VCA. And these are triggered from the keyboard. The LFO modulation can be switched to go to the filter cutoff. The keyboard controls the note pitch. There is a neat trick you can do with the Mini Moog where you can send the main output back in through the audio input and this creates a tasty distortion sound if required. Later instruments had pretty much the same features described here, but some had additional things as well, such as the ones listed here. Next, I'll show you some more examples of monosynths, which use the same basic idea as the Mini Moog, but have very different design approaches. Please note, although I have a lot of keyboards in my studio, I'm not really a keyboard player. The truth is, I don't want to be. I prefer to use external sequencers wherever possible.
Next, let's look at a British synthesizer made around the same time as the Mini Moog, but one that takes a completely different approach to getting its sounds. The VCS3, made by EMS, uses a small pin matrix to connect the various elements together, giving you a tremendous amount of flexibility in creating unique sounds. In this patch, I will make use of the matching EMS TKS sequencer, which can run short note sequences at variable timescales. This is the ARP Odyssey and its sequencer, the 1601, produced in the early to mid 1970s. This Odyssey has the early filter type, which is a 12 dB design. It gives the synth a distinctive tone all of its own. Now, let's look at the Bukulam Music Easel. This instrument is different in almost every way. It is capable of doing some of the things that we have seen in the other instruments, but it really lends itself to doing more abstract and experimental work. So here is a completely abstract, otherworldly experiment. <laughs> Oh. 
concludes our brief look at the monosynth. What I think is important to remember is that this type of instrument launched all genres of music into the modern world. The synthesizer as we know it was now a permanent member of the band. Today I will be playing the ARP Chroma Polysynthesizer. I think the reverse is true. I think disco sold out to us, to be quite honest. I think disco started using things that we do. Uh, I think disco started using found sound. I think disco started using long tracks, started using repetition, and started using elements that we've been using for a long time. I don't think it's that we moved to disco. I think disco moved to us.
episode, I'm going to be patching the Emu Modular Synthesizer. This system was developed in the early 1970s by two synth enthusiasts in Silicon Valley, California. Dave Rossum and Scott Wedge wanted to build a system that competed with the other major manufacturers making modular synths at the time, namely Moog, Buchler and ARP, but which also had something unique about it. That thing was digital technology. The EMU modular features some unique ideas utilising binary and logic circuits not seen on other systems until later in the decade when microprocessors began to be used in synth circuits. But these systems used a very early form of discrete digital logic as opposed to microchips and the ideas are incorporated into the EMU modules such as the binary counters, latches and switches. However, the really clever module, especially for the early 1970s, was the digital memory sequencer, which is a combination of modules which can be used to record pitches and play them in sequences of up to 256 steps long. A major advantage over the 8 or 16 steps found on most analogue sequences of the era. I'll explore this very early digital technology in this episode of Patching Today. I'll start by setting up a very simple VCO VCF, VCA, voice. Taking a cable from the oscillator output into the filter and then into the VCA. Next I'll take the output from the clock source and send it to a multiple so I can send it to several different places later on. The first place it will go is the up input of the 8 position address generator which steps through the voltage source output unit the two modules that make up the analog sequencer then I'll send the clock to trigger two transient generators also known as envelope generators one for the VCA and the other for the low pass filter I'll just check that it's all working as intended before I continue. I've added some reverb and delay on the mixing desk to enhance the sound. A fourth trigger will go to the digital sequencer modules. The way this works is a bit cumbersome, but we can forgive its quirks because it's almost 50 years old. What you have is three modules that work together to create long note sequences. The first thing to do is record the note voltages using the programmer, which also has binary logic switches, which can be used for various things. In this case, for setting an end trigger for the last note in the sequence. 
The second module is the memory address generator, which is the step counter, having a maximum 256 steps. It needs an external clock to move it up or down, and you can loop it back round using those digital triggers that are set on the programmer. One of the amazing quirks on this sequencer is that it counts in octal, meaning that it counts up in eights rather than the usual tens. Watch how the readout is counting up. Pretty confusing at first, but in a way it makes sense for standard musical phrases that are based on fours, eighths and sixteenths. Then there is the memory module itself, which holds the CV and binary data and provides the output jacks. After the notes have been recorded, you have to repatch the modules for playback. You must put the clock into the memory address generator and patch the CV output into the VCO. The idea behind this patch is to use the 8-step analog sequencer to create the notes that I will record onto the digital sequencer and make much longer sequences. So I'll set up three sets of notes on the voltage banks on the analog sequencer. And as you'll see, I'll use them as sources for the digital recorder. Once everything's set up, I can arm the recorder and begin loading the note data. I'll then record the binary stop trigger and repatch the modules ready for playback. Now that the sequence is set and running, I'll tweak the patch by sending the signal through the universal active filter in notch mode. And I'll use some LFOs to animate the sound further.
This section is called Video Lab and it's where I take a look at vintage video and visual synthesis methods, a subject I've become fascinated with recently. Over the coming episodes, I will look at some of the old equipment I found to experiment with, such as analog video mixers, digital switchers, feedback loops, chroma key processors, and vintage cameras and lenses. And how I mix all these things together to create videos to go with my music. Like this one. Well, that's it for the Meme Tune program, episode one. Bye for now.